So let's start again. Welcome back after lunch. So uh, the plan is that uh, we now have uh, those who have, Tim, Tim, Sheila, and uh, Jeff who have uh, given their introductions. Uh, and we have a whole panel. Rolf will give some reflections to what you have heard. And then we will, after that, open up for you also to come here and sit and have uh, some reflections or questions or uh, just mention what you are, uh, what have stuck with you and you want to pursue. Uh, and we do that for like um, yeah, half an hour. And then we have a short break. And then we have the last half hour or how we are doing on time to kind of uh, see all together to bring into what is it that we, in this richness of ideas and, and, and the concepts and everything that we want to pursue and bring with us to tomorrow. So that's the idea. So I give the word actually to you now. Well, thank you. Yeah. Can uh, give us a sign if there is, if you can't hear us. But it, does the voice reach you down there? You're very far away. Yeah. <laughs> okay, but give us a sign because we have a mic we can, can use. Uh, Tor Dag said reflections. I'm uncertain if this is reflections or it's more thoughts or maybe simply showing what I'm struggling with. And, and uh, as such that I start out with my struggle and then others can bring their struggles up here. So, so what we're simply going to do is to give thoughts to each of your presentations. So I'll, I'll start with the, your presentation, Sheila. And, and, and I mean, we, as I said, we have a story that goes way back where Maturana was one of the guys who was running the show in family therapy. And he introduced the world of a multiversa. And I kept thinking when I was listening to you that what's happened, to, and I actually did my PhD on Maturana and was one of those so who... Maybe it would be possible with the mic because you're turning the head. Use this one? Okay. Then I'll have to do... But a bit, um. Okay, you can hear me? Yeah. I had a, sus I had a suspicion. <laughs> Thank you. No, uh, and I've been struggling with the concept of a multiverse ever since back there in the 80s. And now I, when I listen to you, I start to think that, that more and more, especially in this project around the question of the real, that it's more comforting for me today to think that there is only one reality. There is not many realities or many uh, universes. There's one universe, but that university or that r versa is diverse. It's uh, multiplicity. Uh, so, because then it becomes easier for me to relate to the real as real, <laughs> knowing that what the real gives me and presents me is a enormous diversity of events, thoughts, things, objects, and I have to relate to that. So, so, so that's the one thought that I would like to. The other thing that caught my attention became very important was the word posing. And, and to me, posing means to be prepared. Poised. Poised. Yeah. Sorry. Poised. poised. Yeah. Not because posing is. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Okay. Sorry. Yeah. I'm <laughs> suddenly. Yeah, poised. But poised means to be prepared, doesn't it? It means to be. I would say it means to be ready for. Yeah. Sorry. Poised to me means being ready for anything. Yeah. Which you can't prepare for everything. So. Yeah. I, yeah. think, I think it is different from preparing. Yeah, yeah, I'll say, yeah, that's good. That's it. Because the way I've been working with family therapy is essential prin principle is to follow the family. Uh, and to follow the family with curiosity and a not knowing position. So for me, poise, prepared in the sense that I'm prepared to meet what is given to me in a curious manner and in a not knowing manner. It doesn't mean that I don't know things, but it means in meeting another person 
I don't really know what this is all about. So, so, so for, for me as a family therapist, your presentations gives me possibility to think of the real as diverse and it underlines curiosity and not knowing. And especially the last thing, because we have a discussion in Norway at the moment about the not knowing position as a position or as a concept that has in many ways marginalized family therapy. Mm -hmm. But for me, not knowing is actually part of what the real gives me in the sense that I cannot know what's coming. Yeah. I can have a lot of hopes for what is coming, but yeah. I can't know. So that was thought that was elicited for me. Uh, okay, so uh, Tim, I, I, uh, if, I don't know why I started to think that, but if I heard right, a goal orientation, I started to think that from listening to you, I thought, yes, and I'm not sure you said it, or I thought it, but, <laughs> but <laughs> that there is a problem with goal orientation in that it includes the possibility of failure. And when I said, say failure, it's not so much the failures I learn from, but it's the failures that pathologize me. And goal orientation is again very essential in psychotherapy at the moment, especially through the therapeutic alliance. And I suddenly realized that maybe part of the problem we have, especially working with young people and families, is that we become so attached to creating goals that we set up situations for them to fail in a non-productive manner. So that was one thought. And then you said from logic of uncertainty to logic of possibility. And then I kept thinking, uh, one way of thinking about possibilities for me is that there is sort of the real offers me a smorgasbord of possibilities and then I pick. But then I've already decided what the real is. So then I started to think that maybe possibilities, I have to think of possibilities as something else. And you used the word one possibility. So does that mean that, that when I meet somebody and I don't know what to do, I'm uncertain, but I know there is always one possibility. I think it's Samuel Beckett who has the statement, I can't go on, I'll go on. So that introduces for me that possibility in that sense means experimentation. I have to, it invites me to experiment because I don't know what the possibility for exper experimentation, what the reels actually will give me before I start to do things. Um, yes, so, um, because it's very easy in psychotherapy now at least to enter into a neoliberal way of thinking that there is all these possibilities and then I can choose from my preferences or the family can choose from their preferences. And for me it became productive that maybe one of the things I should start to do is to challenge the idea that psychotherapy is a goal-oriented process where we should end up somewhere. And that's back to, as I understand what the, the, the line that, that there is Wayfaring is about walking along, walking side by side, for instance, with the family. Another thought is that you had the word solitude and isolation. I've been very interested in, when I speak now, I'm alone in the sense that every word I say is my doing. So in that sense, I'm always alone. But I've been interested, and, and, and there is a solid, so solitude for me then speaks to this aloneness that I have, both as a private person, but also as a psychotherapist, that what I do, it's me who is doing it. And I'm in, alone in that choice. But I've worked a lot in teams and see that to be alone and, and also value solitude doesn't mean that I have to be lonely because there is always somebody to talk with. One is, my, as you said, is myself. And usually I think I get myself good answers until I say them out aloud. 
Uh, and then I realized that maybe they weren't that good. Uh, but then I can always talk with others about what I've done. So, 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 and I don't know if your word solitude and isolation speaks to the same, but, but it's important in my job, I think, to accept aloneness at the same, knowing that that doesn't mean loneliness or isolation. Uh, okay, so that was thoughts. And there is, I mean, there's so rich here that this is what stuck to me. So I go back to to uh, to, to you, Gert. And um, when you talk about perspectivism and w w what the world demands of us and, and, and gives us. It reminds me of a fact that, uh, and it's again connected to the concept of possibilities, that one of the things that the real is for me, it's a place of constraints. I cannot do all that I want to do. I tried a lot when I was a child uh, to do what I wanted to do. and. Sometimes it worked, but very many times it didn't work because there was constraints there. Other, one thing is your parents and, and the other persons, but the physical reality is constraint. The social reality is, is uh, the real is constraint. So, but in your way of thinking, it reminds me that these constraints, which is also disruptions, is that when I look on my life thinking, how did I end up here? in Kristiansand today, together with you. Well, it has a lot to do with constraints and disruptions in my life. So that means that one of the big gifts of the real is both constraints and, and disruptions, was one thought. Um, and for me, it's very liberating to simply say, where did that can't get that idea from? that you can't have contact with the real, that, that there is sort of uh, the thing in itself and does the ganzisch. And uh, for me, this is the problem I've always had with, with the family therapy, is that the real is very real for me. And you remind me of that. The last thing I thought of when you talk about attention and teach, if I understand you say, as a teacher, your job is to redirect attention the students. Now, I work as a psychotherapist, a family therapist, and one of the things that I've been interested in, in the fact that for me, in order to be a helpful therapist, I thought that my job was to help the client and the family to change. And then I realized that in order to have any chance of helping the client to change, I had to change first. Mm -hmm. So that meant, and how could I change? Well, I needed the client to redirect my attention. So maybe a difference between being a psychotherapist and a teacher is that in psychotherapy, redirection of attention is mutual. That, that one thing is that I work on redirecting the attention of where people have their attention in their life. But in order for me to do that, so they can listen to me, is that I need to be re re redirected by them. Yes. Yes. This is my thoughts so far, that I can say at least. There are other thoughts, but still they are without words. Okay. Uh, any responses from you that you would like to say to me, or we open up for... Yeah. Very briefly, um, it's provocative to think that the real is the multiverse. And it makes a lot of sense to me. And it brings together what could appear to be oppositional views you know, that there is a real uh, world, which there obviously is, and, I, and then this notion of also uh, difference and diversity that we live amongst. So if the real world is a multiverse, 
now, now I hope we have a conversation about what that, what the implications of that way of putting it have for how we think about our practice. Yeah. So it's provocative, thanks. I mean, just to follow up on that, the idea of the multiverse or pluriverse, it was introduced by William James, I think in 1908, and was referring specifically to the idea that the world, there's one world, but it's a world of, um, of, of, of ever extending an infinite differentiation. And, and the important thing then is that it's not parceled up into lots of discrete worlds. It is all the same root system <laughs> that's just ramifying all over the place and continuing to ramify. And that's, some, that's what Bergson called a multiplicity. And I think it's really important. I just wanted to mention two other things about, about poising. It's really interesting because poising also means balance. And, and I was thinking of it in relation to the Greek concept of pyros, meaning in a craft, the, the, the just to catch the exact moment when things are in conjunction to make an intervention. It actually comes from the shed in weaving, where the, the moment where you, you, you throw the shuttle through the shed, and you have to, if you're a good craftsman, you have to get the, that moment exactly right. And it seems to me that in the sorts of therapeutic interventions you're talking about, this question of, of timing and getting, getting the balance point is, is, is rather critical. And just one, one, one extra thing. Um, yeah, it was absolutely clear that we have to, when we're talking about possibility and not talking about possibilities, and the difference is, is, is absolutely critical. Can I ask you one more? Thing? Um, I'd love to get into a conversation about this notion of the real being a multiverse and the idea of perspectives. You know, how, uh, Garrett, I really liked what you had to say, and it seems so difficult to talk about what we want to talk about without talking about perspectives. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting challenge when you encounter that, to see can I, can I keep talking without using a word, because that brings a lot. Um, I, I want to comment on your point about um, not knowing. Um, because I feel there's something missing there. Um, and the, the, the solution <laughs> lies in the word curiosity. Um, because there is one, we are doing a lot of etymology, but one etymology is to say curiosity has care in it. So you can't say what you do there is, is not to just sit there and see what happens. When you're curious, you, you care from a particular angle. Um, so it's, I would say, to be a therapist is to be attentive to the situation from a particular interest. And I think if you don't bring in the, the interest, then you, you lose something. And you can say, what's your interest as a therapist? I would say it's in the, the freedom of the ones you're working with. And I would say that's my interest as an educator. I, I act and try to perceive always with the question of the freedom of my students. And that cannot be planned. And therefore, knowledge is not something where you just say, here's the evidence and I execute the evidence, because that's the opposite of what your interest is about. But I'd like to bring the interest in because that means that you, you are attentive for very particular reasons and, and out of a very particular position. And, and that is, yeah, if, if we forget that, then the without knowing becomes a bit, it, it loses that. And I think the other interesting question is about the, the real. Um, and we also had a bit of a conversation over lunch to say the real is not the same as what is material. But you can say we encounter something real when it, it poses cons constraints. But social constraints are also real, but they are not material. Uh, or yeah, when you encounter resistance or 
The opposite of the real is fantasy, and fantasy is to think that there are no limits. So I think it's interesting to also when this word real or reality is there, that rather than to try to define it, also to say, well, what characterizes it and, and what is it the, the opposite um, of? And I, I'll think about sort of re mutual redirecting attention. Um, because as a teacher, I feel uncomfortable. This to me sounds too much like learning communities, but we, we can come back to that. <laughs> uh, I don't, uh, <coughs> this, uh, one, one word that I seem not to be able to get rid of is difference. And, and, and I had an interest in, in trying to read Gilles Deleuze, who's some of, one of these difference-oriented philosophers. And, and, um, and I think that the, the strength of family therapy is that it's that kind of therapy that has worked the most on how to relate to difference in the sense that people are different but also to the fact that what comes in my life as something new and not met before comes in and, and gives itself in a way that it forces, that it, like Bateson says, the difference that makes a, a difference for me. So, yeah. My colleagues, do you have uh, any? Another thing is, one thing is my, intent, but, but you three have been listening to each other also, so, 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 so I think we should also come and open up for you. Uh, and if there are anybody in the audience who want to come up and take a chair, just raise your hand. Mm -hmm. But have you any comments on each other's? Uh, to introduce uh, the, the, my knowledge that uh, the not knowing actually also relates to Søren Kierkegaard, um, which is quite interesting because he asked, he's also about the moment, or oblique, Kairos. Um, and for me, Kairos is maybe mm, the very essential in the meeting. Now I don't know what Kairos is. Maybe because that's the unknown. I think the unknown is more not only the theoretical uh, um, position, but it's the it's a essential position to all of us if we are open to what might come. Mm -hmm. thinking uh, from my own experience um, that there is something with uh, the complexity of the real that is under uh, I, I mean it, it's it, today the complexity of the system seems to be overwhelmingly big and the, the complexity of the real is being underestimated uh, people don't really see because uh, because um, we have this bureaucratic system that um, uh, uh, gives us a lot of documentation 
needs. And documentation is actually seen as a substitute for the real. So documentation becomes the real. Uh, the product of the real uh, is documented, while the process of the real is, is, goes unnoticed <laughs> in a way. So I think uh, it's, something, it's something about uh, uh, how, can we, how can we accept the complexity of the real and try to, to, to show it in research, but also in practice, and in the, in the moments, uh, because it's it, it's there in the moments, and try to uh, somehow fight this complexity of documentation or, or of of systems. Uh, I also think this has something to do with uh, with I mean the complexity of reality is something honest, something is there, it's it's true, you you see it. You experience it on your body and in your practice and with other people, but the complexity of systems is a kind of power or manipulation or something that is forced on us, which is, uh, and, and I do think this, uh, this idea, which I think is quite real in a way, that complexity, that systems or, or documentation uh, comes instead of reality. I think that is that is really a problem today. And how do we how do we look at that? How do we write about that? How do we think aloud about that? To me that is uh, 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 that, that is my interest <coughs> just now. Of course. Because there's a wonderful paper by a psychologist called David Rubin. It's called Go for the Skill, and uh, in which he argues, and he's talking specifically about the psychology of memory, and he says that anything that can be explained using what he calls a complex structure model can also be explained using a complex process model. And just for an example, um, if, if, if I play uh, a piece of Bach on my cello, that's an extremely complex process that results in the music. But I could put on a CD or a record or a gramophone record, which has all the structure there, but the process is a very simple one of mechanical transcription. So you have either a complex process, simple structure, or complex structure, simple process. And, and, I rather, and, and the, the, proce the world, processually, is very complex. I, I don't believe it when people say, that the world used to be simple and has now become complex. It was always complex, but I think that what has happened and what has caused the kind of issue that has just been raised is a shift from the complexity of process to the complexity of structure. So when we complain about the complexity, it's because it's a structural complexity that is hard to handle rather than a processual complexity which uh, in which we can sort of engage in a productive way. And that's the issue. Um, I would hate to think what a simple world would be like. Yeah, I, in terms of both comments, I, I, but um, this notion, we were talking this morning over coffee about um, sort of the privilege of being, you know, senior, where exactly the uh, complexity of the system you can kind of ignore because you're senior and you're more comfortable and you don't have to worry about losing your job and so forth. Um, and then you can embrace the complexity of the real. Um, so uh, it's a, a great distinction, I think, to draw. I think it's really important. And how do we, uh, in our practice, find ways to disrupt that system, the, the complexity of the system and the structures by integrating and, and inviting and participating in some very different kinds of processes of relating. Yeah. Um, yeah, I also want to say a few things. Uh, coming back to the, the, the Kierkegaard point, um, 
I think I would agree at, at sort of a, a humane level that for all of us it's important to, to live our lives in a, in a way that's, that's open rather than that way where we think what's going to come. But for the professional, and I think it's interesting, Tim, that you brought in the whole question of, of the profession and the professional. I think professionals need to know why they are there. They don't need to know beforehand what to do or which interventions will work, but you need to have a sense of why you are there, even if that's fragmented, difficult, tentative. But if you can't answer to the question, why are you here claiming to be a family therapist or why are you here claiming to be a teacher, then you need to do some work before you're allowed to go back into the wild, I think. So there is something there about what what we should not want to know and what we should try to know. And I think in this conversation we should try to to know why why we are there in that particular professional role, even if that's difficult and that's part of the ongoing conversation. Um, and yeah, I think this whole question of how we relate to what we we encounter and what we think is forced upon us, that still puzzles me. Uh, because the, the other thing I, I said when we were talking this morning, and, and Sheila, you pointed out, yeah, in, in a position of privilege, you, you can be a bit uh, obstinate. But then I said, oh, well, I've always been a difficult child. So I've, obstinacy has sort of been my, my life journey. Um, and that also comes with risks, like, yeah, leaving a job and going to another country simply because you don't want to be part of the system. So I, I appreciate that once you are in a position of privilege, you can play that card also more explicitly. But that doesn't mean that there is no agency be, before you reach that point. And, and then it's really interesting what, yeah, what we do there or how courageous we, we can be. moment, but there's, there's one thing in your talk, Gert, when you introduced world returning philosophies. <laughs> and and you say, I think you said that Dewey said that experience is real. So that, that kind of, ah, what experience re is real? Because there's a lot to talk about experience. How do you experience that? And when you articulate experience, then it, you turn it into something. So you kind of have to put some words to it. And for me, that's kind of where something slips. So it's also related to when you introduced Marion, something gives itself before it shows itself. So, by, so in a way, uh, experience is when it's something for you, it shows itself. So for me, like to be human, ah, this it, it's, could be related even to the myth of the fall, when we ate of the tree of, tree of knowledge. So there was something happening there that even in our experience, there is some knowing relation to the world that puts us outside the world. So your notion of the perspective who puts us outside the world. So there is a kind of outsideness that is the curse of being human, so to speak. And, and, uh, and and that uh, um, yeah yeah so there is a kind of outsideness that we have to kind of live with so kind of, so to kind of to to be in the world is it's it's a project all the time to kind of come into the world as from an outside position and you use the phrase to come into the world and Aaron used the phrase come into the world and some colleagues said yeah what kind of what are you talking about there's no position outside the world but there's something there that interests me that we kind of come from the outside because we are according to the myth of the fall we are expelled from the garden of eden so and that's in a way is we are expelled from the world and that's kind of the human condition as opposed to perhaps the 
animals way of living in the in the world Any other? You keep the time to it on. You give a sign when we're. Two minutes to a break. How, how much? Two minutes. Two minutes? Any? Yes. We have four chairs, so you can already start sitting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Right <laughs> Go ahead. Uh, um, um, I have a, a kind of a, a question, really, uh, or, or um, observation about, uh, and it, it begins in, in Tim, in your um, illustration of um, um, with these uh, people following uh, tradition in, or in generation, and then and this idea of stepping out of of, of, of tradition and turning towards the child and saying, you know, it, it, "This is about me." And said that was in the sense how I understood you. And I was, uh, when you said that, I was thinking also about um, the re really one of the papers got, that you shared with us, the, the one about the pa Parks Eichmann paradox. So I was kind of, and I was kind of thinking um, that in a sense that was also an illustration exactly about what's at stake in professional practices. This, this question of, of um, uh, always being part of something and, and always having this uh, to consider should I uh, um, should I go on or should I take part in this or should I uh, step out and say wait a minute and that's kind of uh, for me a, a figure of what's always at stake or, or in, in the very sort of micro level of being in conversation with someone when do I uh, say something, when, or when do I not say something, and when I say something, what's it, this thing that I say, and how do I do it? And, uh, but also, sort of being a professional or being part of a tradition, or as um, Gat was speaking about just now, um, being uh, uh, should I stay in this job or should I simply say uh, I can't uh, take part in this anymore? So I was just. Um, was that, uh, I wondered, uh, Tim and Gat, really, uh, uh, if you. Um, uh, do, do, do you relate to what I say? And, and uh, is there, um, uh, or uh, how, uh, how do you think about that? What do you think? Is that a question that uh, can be responded to? <laughs> you tried first, I'm not sure. No. <laughs> no. I lost uh, the no. thread for a minute, sorry. <laughs> well, sorry, uh, no, so um, no, what I was wondering what, what was, I, I think, Tim, you uh, um, illustrated sort of this this being part of a tradition is can be seen as a, uh, a taking care of the world. It, it's it's being considerate, being in something. And as I understood you, you, you said that sort of an indigenous, many indigenous people think of this is life is one possibility. It's about continuing, um, and then stepping out of that is uh, sort of the the, the modern. Uh, way of, of relating to uh, issues or, or saying that it, this is not about tradition or it's not about the world, it's about me. And, um, and I, uh, my association there was that I think that, uh, I wonder if that's some of the, one of the things that you uh, problematize in your paper about the Parks Eichmann paradox, where you say that Olaf Eichmann was sort of following tradition yeah. and Rosa Parks refused to follow tradition. It's also this um, uh, relating to what's going on. I think for me that's indeed the existential point where you say um, to exist as a subject or as an I is to to take those moments seriously where you encounter your freedom and need to figure out do I go with the flow or do I say no um, and you cannot even before and say you should always say no or you should always go with the flow um, whether that is a, a modern possibility that's an interesting question so I really like this idea which I, I 
get from a, a book uh, by Christine Gruwitz, she's called, where she says, so perspectivism is the moment of freedom because suddenly the individual can stand somewhere, whereas before that you're all over the place. So that's, that's the gain of what, what actually happens in that reconfiguration. But if you then lose the world, that's quite a big price to pay. And then the question is, can you, is, is there an, another way where you can stand as a subject? And I think that's what the, the existential philosophers are trying to say. It's what Pranger is saying, is that what we do in teaching is constantly calling people to say, to, to, to stand in the call of the world, which is very different than to stand in your, your sovereign observer position. So I think those, those are some issues there. Now, how that relates to, uh, yeah, so I've given away the language for that, so I cannot say how, how does that work in other worldviews, because that, that <laughs> we have to find different, that's what I like about the one possibility, because that's not a worldview, but it's an, an, an articulation of an existential position. I'm very taken by the idea of the middle voice of the verb. Not, not which means you don't have to choose between the active, I did this, or the passive, this was done to me. But I am inside what I'm doing. So I'm, I'm doing things, but I'm also in, because I'm inside what I'm doing, I'm also transformed in the process of doing it. And that means you, you, you can get away from this endless thing. Is it subject or object? Is it agency or patience? patience? You're, you're in the middle of it, in the, in the milieu, in the midst. Oh, and the other thing I was going to mention, I remember, is, um, is I would want to separate out observation or to observe and to objectify. I say to observe literally means to follow what's going on. And like when you observe a practice, uh, or you, you regularly carry it out, uh, it's equivalent to listening. Uh, it's actually a mode of participation. Um, or at least that's what it originally means. So you can have observation as a way of paying attention to things without objectification. Um, it's a confusion. It's always being, these things are always being confused in in my discipline of anthropology, when people talk about participant observation, and they say, well, how can you do that? You can't be both participating and observing at the same time, because one is asking you to be out, outside the action and the other inside. But I think, no, actually, you can't have observation in the strict sense without participation, without a sensory coupling in perception and action between you and the thing that you're interested in. I need to do a, 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 a quick one, and, and maybe that comes back. For me, there is a, an important distinction between metaphysical statements and, and existential attempts. And one way to put it is to say, you can say the question whether I'm active or, or passive or in the middle. You can make those statements, but they, I would call them metaphysical. Um, the existential point is, well, knowing that or irrespective of that, what will you do when the, the Nazi soldier knocks on your door and asks, are there any Jews in this house? Um, and then to say, well, I'm neither active nor passive is not the point there. So for me, that's, that's something where I think the, the existential perspective <laughs> tries to to raise a different question. And then is the question is, can we, is that knowledge then still relevant or does it become an excuse <laughs> for not having to respond to, to what you meet there? That's where, I'm, where I try to cause some trouble but also keep troubling myself. Yeah. To answer that, but it feels really weird now because I know it's almost break and I wanted to raise it a rather different question. Go for it. I really enjoyed the discussion you were having already. We had um, a whole day. Yeah, true. Um, so the question that I'm wondering about is about the uh, future, I guess. Um, you've been talking a lot about time and you've, um, Tim introduced uh, sort of the idea of 
tradition and the teacher turning on towards the children rather than on towards the tradition they were following. And uh, what seemed to me interesting was that when you begin to speak about carrying in on rather than going into the future, I was really just wondering what, what sort of future, what, what, what does the open future look like? Uh, and you also introduced this idea of possibility versus possibilities, which I would want you to sort of expand upon because I thought it meant that possibility is open whereas possibilities is to choose from. Uh, that's just sort of what I thought about. We are now at the point where one possibility is to continue, <laughs> but at the same time, we as plan that you can sort of uh, talk with each other and with this leads up to what to do tomorrow. So I think instead of that we keep the question and to the dog just Okay, we, we are, I'll leave. In a way, we have decided. I think we have from from Todd's eyes. I I think we have decided that we'll have a ten minute break. But you will, during this break, think about what you are struggling with or what you are in, in a way seeing conscious of that you want to go more into or just to elaborate with, uh, with uh, these people and all of us tomorrow. Mm. So what is your interest up till now and what would be good to touch upon tomorrow? Mm. And then when we come back, you will be able to talk amongst each other, maybe four, four and four persons, and, and we will listen to what you have to say and bring that with us into the planning of tomorrow. Mm. So first 10 minutes break, and then it, that's uh, about, that's 10 minutes, you know? So, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so this is not relative, this is... <laughs> 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 okay.